Well, alrighty, let's just cover some uh, S10 Blazer suspension upgrades that I'm trying to get in process uh, before spring, or at least early spring. The newfound power that I'm getting out of that Turbo 4.8, it has uh, tremendously exposed how inadequate my suspension is on the Blazer to the point that it's pretty much uncontrollable. So, we're gonna start in the front and work our way to the back and hopefully get a suspension that'll at least allow me to make some decent test hits and not end up sideways heading towards the ditch. When I first bought the 85S10 Blazer, the previous owner cut literally, I guess it would be considered a coil and a half. I know he cut off at least one full coil of the front coil springs to lower the front of that S10. Here's where the problem lies. When you cut off that much of the front coil spring, it literally puts the lower A arm less than nine sixteenths of an inch from hitting the frame. So basically, if you think about it, when it lowered the front end by cutting that coil spring, now with any suspension travel, the stupid A arm could hit the frame, so which really plays havoc and unloads the front end and makes the car scary to control at speed. So basically what I've done, you know, cause I'm cheap and I can't afford to go out and buy you know, coil overs and all that high dollar stuff. So I've been on a bunch of the S10 uh, racer websites, S10 forums, whatever, whatever, yellow bullet, just trying to find kind of a better than just a stock setup, but you know, maybe not as great as a aftermarket uh, race specific front suspension. So part of the problem I'm having, like I said, these coil, for front coil springs are worthless. They're not doing anything. They're actually making it more dangerous at speed. So those got to go. Um, as far as my front suspension goes, my game plan is these are Moog four-cylinder S10 replacement coil springs. Um, these are part number 5658 which I have found through my research online, almost every spring manufacturer that you can find at your normal uh, auto parts stores, AKA Advance Auto Parts, AutoZone, O'Reilly's, they all kind of tend to use that 5658 part number in conjunction with some kind of alpha beginning to represent these four cylinder springs. Okay. <clears throat> now, what gets us in trouble is that on most of the forums I, vis I was visiting and doing my research on, a ton of people, I mean a lot, I'd say 90%, were saying, well, we ran the four-cylinder front coil springs, and it lowered with a V8 swap. Now, let me preface that. With a V8 swapped S10, it lowered the front end about three quarters of an inch to one inch. Okay, so let's just keep that in mind. All right, so now, and, and I have not scaled this vehicle. We're just going on hopes and dreams, I guess. I have the LS swap, which an LS V8 is lighter than an old school small block with iron heads, for example, but I've also added a turbo and a hot side uh, setup plus an intercooler, but I did relocate the battery to the back of the vehicle. So I'm, I'm kind of shooting in the dark in a way because without being able to scale, not just weigh the vehicle, I can't really accurately estimate how much weight I have on the front and the rear or the left and right, you know, the different corners, et cetera, et cetera. 
So what I was trying to do was look at the spring rates on the Moog website and just kind of get a good idea of where I would want to start. So I ended up going with the four cylinder springs, which I'm hoping, fingers crossed, will give me a slightly higher front end uh, height that I have right now and still store enough energy to allow some front end separation on takeoff or on launch because with my current cut springs in the front it doesn't really do anything like even if it tries to put to uh, transfer weight there's nothing to support the front end so it literally just kind of go just momentarily kind of goes up maybe a half an inch or so and then just falls right back down because there's no stored spring rate or ability of the for the front coil springs to lift the front end at all and my front shocks aren't like a 90 10 valving shock that would allow the front end to come up whatever it was coming up and then slowly come back down that's another thing i have to purchase i am going with the calvert racing uh just front 90 10 non-adjustable shocks uh they're i think they're 120 dollars, 118 dollars a pair that's not bad that's not a big investment i just haven't ordered them yet so basically, I'm going to do the four-cylinder spring. I bought these tubular upper control arms from Speedway years ago. And I mean years ago, like five years ago or something. With the intention of put them on, putting them on the Blazer with two-inch lowering spindles. We ixnade that. That's, not, that's no longer a good idea. Um, if you guys go to the street racing channel, the SRC channel... Uh, there's a good video on there where they talk about the S10 that Billy the Kid races and how in an S10 chassis or pretty much any chassis, the worst thing you can do for drag racing is to run a drop spindle. Okay? So in this video, he, the father, uh, Bill Sr., he is explaining that when you drag race, you want weight transfer and you want front end separation to aid you in that weight transfer. Plus you wanna control the speed at which that front end is able to come back down. So <laughs> when you use a drop spindle of any design, you've basically robbed yourself in my example, I have a brand new set of first gen S10 two inch drop spindles over there in the box I've never even opened. They're worthless for drag racing because that two inch drop is immediately deducted from your front end travel on the vehicle. So now you're trying to overcome not only a stock, you know, when, if you're trying to get the front end to come up, You've now handicapped yourself two inches of front end travel by running a stupid drop spindle. Well, clearly I did not know that in the beginning. So those will be for sale. I'm more than, well, more than willing to make somebody a good deal on them if they still want to you know, build a cruiser or something that they're not specifically drag racing, they'd work perfectly. But finding out this new information led me to just say, okay, get rid of those. We're gonna use the stock spindles. We're gonna go ahead and put on the tubular upper A arms with new Moog ball joints, just as a pure weight savings on the front end. Plus I believe they're gonna be a little bit better um, geometry when I do my alignment and stuff like that. We're gonna go with the Calvert 9010 front shocks with the four-cylinder Moog Springs, no cutting, no none of that junk. Once we can get the front suspension rebuilt or fixed from the previous owner's sins, then I have to go in and I have to modify my current transmission cross member because in my attempt to figure out what was going on with my chassis and why it's unloading and kicking out and just being uncontrollable, I found out that 
my, what, what do they call your transmission angle. Like when you're setting up your driveline angles, you start at your crankshaft, which goes through your transmission to your output shaft, and then everything goes back from there when you're setting up your driveline angles. Well, I found out that my driveline angle at my transmission was 100% wrong. The recommended angle on a vehicle is about two to three degrees negative or down. So you want your transmission output to be around two to three degrees down. I had mine at a neutral zero, which was bad, but I was kind of limited because of the way I, <laughs> the way I made my transmission cross member, it didn't really allow me to lower the back of the transmission any farther than zero degrees. I had this exact same transmission, energy suspension cross member transmission mount, and I ruined it because I was trying desperately to make this mount shorter in height, <clears throat> excuse me, to where I could get my negative two to three degrees at my transmission, and I ruined it. So just in case you guys ever want to try this, don't. These holes, if you guys can see that, these holes in the bottom of these energy suspension transmission mounts only go down about 250 thousandths, okay? Um, I don't know why I didn't notice that in the beginning, but what I had done was I cut 200 thousandths off of the, my original energy suspension transmission mount to try to lower the back of that transmission and ruined it because there are no threads past what you can see here. It goes into like a hollow void below this outer area and it was basically junk. So, huh, live and learn, but it's going to be a lot more work for me because I'm going to have to section out and plate in the middle portion of my transmission cross member in order to set that correct transmission geometry. Okay, once I get that done, then I'm gonna work my way back and set my rear pinion angle because that is also gonna be a product of what your, what your transmission and your drive shaft provide. That's how you figure out your pinion angle. Um, just as a generic figure, Caltrack, Calvert, Caltrack, whatever, they recommend with their Caltrack bars on a leaf spring vehicle, the rear pinion angle should be two to four degrees negative or down. Um, in a leaf spring vehicle, and I, I've gone over this a million times with people, but somehow they never follow it 100%. In a leaf sprung vehicle, two things you should know. The pinion angle should always, now we're not talking about four wheel drives or none of that junk. I'm talking about a street car, drag race car setup. Your pinion angle is always gonna be slightly negative because a leaf spring suspension has a greater than average pinion rise under full load or full power that isn't experienced in a three link, four link, like ladder bar type suspension. So when you set up your rear suspension, you have to account for the amount of pinion rise you're gonna get, which is literally like, I don't know, some kind of wizardry if you think about it, because how are you gonna know how much that pinion is gonna rise under full load? Because not only do your leaf springs affect that, your with or without cow track or some kind of traction bar, you know, aids, plus the amount of power you make can directly affect how much pinion rise you experience. So it's like you've all, you really need to have some way to adjust your rear pinion angle as you move up in horsepower to where you correct your angles as you go faster. But, like I said, this is a learning process. I'm in a whole new world now with this vehicle, making a lot more power than I've ever made before, and it is not happy, it is not working. So the plan is 
get the you know drive line angles figured out get my rear pinion angle set then we're going to start looking at you know right aftermarket valving shocks possibly going to the split mono leaf leaf springs warning warning anybody who's building an s10 blazer be fully aware all of the rear leaf springs that they sell on eBay, most actually every leaf spring, aftermarket leaf spring I've found, they're not set up for the weight of a blazer. Okay, I didn't know that. I never heard that. When I was researching, trying to lower my blazer without big, thick, lowering blocks, I had never, never heard someone say, oh, you have to run a heavier spring with a blazer because of the weight back there. And I, you know, live and learn. Okay, fine, I fell in that hole. Now I gotta dig my way out of it. When I researched it through General Motors or GM, I found out a blazer, especially, or two-wheel drive blazer, because I don't know crap about a four-wheel drive one, they came with a heavy duty rear leaf spring pack with four leafs in it and was the, had the strongest rate of any leaf spring they put in the S10 vehicles. So basically, I had taken out the you know recommended leaf spring pack on that blazer, basically just scrapped them, put in these stupid 3 inch lowering leafs and they're nowhere near strong enough to support the back, the weight of the back of that blazer, especially under acceleration. What I found out, and I'm trying not to make this go too awfully long, was those springs were so weak that when I would try to just even take off under normal power, it would squat down in the back, which you're never, never supposed to do. At least spring suspicion, suspension does not squat. Anybody who has a leaf spring suspension and they're squatting, they're not doing it right because leaf spring suspensions are never supposed to squat. Mine was squatting so severely that the frame on the back of the blazer was hitting the housing on the rear end. Think about that. That thing was squatting like a dog taking a dump so severely that the frame was hitting the freaking rear end housing. So to remedy that, I added overload helper coil springs over my existing shocks, which did help tremendously stiffen up the rear suspension to keep it from, you know, taking a dump on itself every time I tried to launch. But I need to get that rear, I got to get everything back there tuned properly to be able to launch, you know, accept the weight transfer from the front hook the tires, not rebound and unload. I mean, there's a lot going on back there that I really need to fix. So that's where we're headed. I just wanted to throw out a real quick video about rebuilding the front suspension to be more conducive to drag racing, fixing my transmission angle, and then setting my driveline angles from there to be able to get this thing to hook up and go down the road. So I hope I didn't bore you guys too much. Um, I just had these parts, some of these parts come in recently, and I thought, oh, I'll make a quick video and just kind of share with you guys. Thanks, guys. Please like, some, subscribe, and share.